All men must choose between two paths. All right, put your hands in the air. Good is the choice of honor, valor, and heroism. You're a federal man! You random citizen. But evil. Well, it's just cooler. Hit it. Hello, it's sugar time. And that's enough about me. You're all here for the blue boy. With a new TV series and a sequel movie in the works, I think a lot of people are wondering what's in store for Megamind. And where else can we look for hints but in what's already out? So get your magnifying glasses and let's see what we could find. Starting with what else but the original movie. When people talk about the details in Megamind, they usually talk about how Metro Man appears behind Megamind for a frame in the beginning, or how Roxanne's dress changes colors over the course of the movie. But is there anything that people haven't noticed yet? You might be surprised. Let's take a look. Megamind keeps his motif from infancy. We all know there's nothing saying that Megamind's parents are evil. They're even in white. All we know about them is they're from a technologically advanced society, and they saved their son. And the women appear to be a bit thicker than the men. On the other hand, they also like popping up their collars, so maybe that's where he got that from. His binky is quite versatile. Let's see what he used it for. A lightning weapon on his tricycle? A nightlight? A popcorn zapper? a prototype for his dehydration gun, and a helmet to deflect balls. The first time Minion played dead. Some days it felt like it was just me and Minion against the world. After Megamind creates an explosion in the school, most people see him smiling as the bus takes him away. However, when Metro Man picks up the school and flies off with it, Megamind is heartbroken. Did the newspapers say anything beyond the big headlines? Surprisingly, yes. The newspapers fly by fast, so for the most part we can only catch little things. And they love shopping. We got Battle of the Century. Megamind uses 82-step plan to take over Metro City. Winter Pageant finds its new queen. Good beats evil. City Hall under attack. Metro Man victorious. Defender of Metro City. City expects large crowds at this year's ceremony. Megamind Behind Bars once again, Metro Man Museum opening, Metro Man triumphs over Megamind's evil plot. The text on this newspaper seems to be complete gibberish. However, I saved the best for last. Take a look at this newspaper. There's real text there. It flies by fast and is blurry, but under each headline is the continuation of an article with important text. Here's what I've been able to make out. Hometown Boy makes bad by various authors accredited on different papers. Chin Ko, who worked on visual development for Megamind, Yimi Tong, the production coordinator, etc. Metro City Prison, Metro City. The question of nature versus nurture was on the tips of everyone's tongue when the blue child, most commonly known as Megamind due to the enormous size of his cranium, once again broke out of prison. A few, a small few, have protested the seeming cruelty of imprisoning a child merely because he had the misfortune of landing in the city prison. The warden disagrees. You don't know this kid. I've watched the little criminal since he was in diapers. This kid, bad. Seed. I got experienced. Hear who? Child services have been able to secure furloughs for the child's education. The diabolical plans and blueprints discovered in his prison cell do reflect the makings of a genius gone wrong. It is Golto, the child into an acceptable. The child has been isolated from the general population for the protection of the adults. The has reported the child is under protected custody after an in occurred with several other. The other prisoners refused. So when I started looking at the newspapers to see if there was anything on them, I did not expect to find this much text. But now we know what Megamind's real name is. It's Megamind. <laughs> the, the prisoners just named him that. <laughs> Which makes sense. It's not like they're going to call him John Smith. He's in prison. They're going to give him some sort of nickname. So Megamind's real name is Megamind. And we also get a little bit more about the warden and what his opinions were. A little bit harsher than I was expecting, but... I guess now we see why he was in prison all that time. 
And it does also sound like there were people who protested this, except not too many people. So those are kind of interesting tidbits that I didn't expect to find when I started, but there they are. And I do think there is a little bit more text on this paper, but because it gets cut off by the screen, and it flies by real fast and it's very blurry, it's a little bit too hard to make out. I saw people wondering how the alligator trap got closed again, so let's check what levers and buttons Megamind presses to scare Roxanne. First he uses the lever for the alligators, then he uses the lever down here for the gun. The lever for the alligators is suddenly back up. He uses the lever for the alligators again, but this time it's for the super drills. Then he uses a different lever at the bottom for saws, followed by whatever you would call this joystick-like thing for the boots. And finally, he desperately turns the wheel in the middle for the flamethrower. So it's a little strange that he uses the same lever twice in the beginning, because they animated it differently each time. So I'm not sure it would have really saved money or anything. Maybe pulling levers was just more dramatic than pressing buttons? I don't know. <laughs> but he used the same lever twice. I think most people would agree that Megamind didn't want to kill Metro Man. This is supported by many things in the movie. Number one, they expect Metro Man to escape to the extent that they're not even paying attention to him being trapped. <laughs> Number two, Metro Man has to start PG cursing because Megamind is about to walk away without even noticing. What did he just say? Number three, when Megamind is talking to Metro Man to try and figure out what's happening, Minion notices the death ray is about to go off. Somehow he doesn't look excited as he tries to warn Megamind. Number four, after the explosions, when they think they see Metro Man coming, Megamind and Minion are relieved for a moment before panicking. <sighs> Metro Man! <gasps> Metro Man! Metro Man! <laughs> I don't think there was a big debate, but it's nice to look at all the little details pointing to this. Plus, there's even more evidence in the novels that I'll add later. Don't look Megamind in the eye. Who are these guys in Metro Man's museum? Are there more heroes hanging out somewhere? Now we know where Metro Man's laser is in his eye. Roxanne enters from the hero side of the museum. Megamind enters from the villain side. They both exit the hero side. When Megamind states he wants to find a new hero, Roxanne calls. The movie is pointing out that she's the perfect pick. We must find a suitable subject. Someone of noble heart and mind. Who puts the welfare of others above their own. What on earth is that? Let's just look at the toys Megamind's alligator crocodiles have in their private disco room. They have a little skeleton plush, what looks like an alligator squeaky toy, and a beach ball. Seems legit. Hal has a poster of Roxanne in his room. This ad a Metro Man advertising Tooth Time toothpaste. Hey, it looks like my hair. <laughs> Some people wonder why later in the movie, Roxanne hangs up papers to try and figure out Megamind's plans. But this is how Megamind does things. You can see all the way in the beginning, Megamind has papers hanging up in his cell. Perhaps resembling a mobile for a crib? Even the title is made via papers hanging from the ceiling. Roxanne took pictures of his plans and is recreating what's in the pictures. Which is why she's hanging papers from the ceiling. It's when she steps back that she realizes he draws his ideas out with his unusual form of art. When Megamind says he can explain, the poster behind him says, no, you can't. Staging Megamind as the next hero. What does the B stand for on Hal's costume? Most likely brawn? I'll go over why I think that later. Also, why is Megamind on leash? What are you up to, Hal? <laughs> This TV is trying to tell Megamind that the game is over. And Megamind, this one for Space Stepmom! You lied to her! Hal cares about Space Stepmom. Kind of funny considering what I'll go over later. Did you know that Metro Man's hair is going gray because of his fights with Megamind? I'll go over why I think that later too. When Megamind drops the cape, Roxanne picks it up. At this point, she's taking on the role of the hero, even though she doesn't have any powers or technology. How did Megamind stop the fuss? It's not shown for very long, but he has a saw blade on his hand. 
he ends up breaking it on Hell's Face shortly after he's revealed as Megamind. Let's check out what modes his D-Gun has. We have Debilitate, Demoralize, Decoupage. <laughs> what are you doing, Megamind? Dehydration, Decompress, Deregulate, Death Ray, and Destroy. It's got a lot of options on that little gun. That's hardly everything. I didn't even mention Minion running over people in the beginning, but we have to stop somewhere. While we get a little more detail about the Warden, most are just fun little additions that don't really tell us what the next movie or TV series will be like. There is a follow-up short called Button of Doom, which I'll have linked in the description if you want to watch it. It's only about 15 minutes long, so it pretty much rushes through an A plot. So I don't think there would be too much detail to add from it beyond current Megamind finding former Megamind annoying. Talk about a crushing defeat! The old evil me is so annoying! Basically, it goes through Megamind learning that he has to be himself as a hero and not copy Metro Man, while he tries to take out a robot, Mega Megamind. But what about the novels? While I don't know the behind the scenes of writing novel adaptations of movies, it seems like the authors writing the novels often get earlier drafts of the script to work from. So when you see a novel from a movie, a lot of times many lines will be exactly the same with a few changes here and there. And sometimes you see scenes that may have been deleted or changed. Because of that, I thought there might be more insight found in the novels for Megamind. So let's take a look. To start with, I am Megamind. This is a book for very young children, so I wouldn't expect to find a lot here. But I did take note of a couple of things. First, this. I'm only showing this because I think this is a version of Megamind that might actually kill Metro Man. <laughs> That's the angriest Megamind I've ever seen. Also, Metro Man gets a lot of stars. Second, this book more clearly states what is left, mostly unsaid in the movie. But this time, something went wrong. We can already figure that he never meant to kill Metro Man, but this is probably one of the most blatant statements of that. Third, there's a plot point in the book that isn't in the movie. Megamind and Roxanne go to Metro Man's hideout specifically to find more DNA to make another hero. I think this was a plot point that probably got shifted toward the end of movie production. The movie doesn't exactly state what the plan is beyond going to Metro Man's place to find a weakness. Maybe this was changed because it would have created the question of, if he can make a gun to make another superhero, then why not make a gun to defuse him? It might also have just seemed repetitive, and like something Roxanne would probably say was a bad idea. Otherwise, this is mostly just good if you want a book with some images of Megamind. I also read Megamind Bad Blue Brilliant, the novel. This has a lot more insight into what the movie might have been before the final changes. Much of it is the same with one or two line differences, especially in the beginning and the end. Some of those line changes we know are ad-libbed by the cast, so we can see what the original lines in the script probably were. Some little things are, it mentions meeting Roxanne, though it doesn't specify exactly when. Megamind is writing a 900-page autobiography for children. Also, in the book, he's strapped to his chair. He asks if he's getting a pickaxe instead of a puppy. He might have done this in the movie, but in the book, it mentions that when he escaped, he pulled a lever to let all the prisoners out of their cells. Roxanne's wash the bag line isn't there. Megamind says the potato-tomato line correctly in the book. Megamind says this plan was just a prelude instead of arguing with Minion. Just Metro Man's PG cursing here, <laughs> in case you're wondering uh, what he was saying in the movie, I guess. Are you dead, crab nuggets? What did he just say? Crab nuggets? <laughs> fish crack oh. Try to rock black. <laughs> Megamind says the lines that were in the trailer as well as the lines in the movie. So this conversation was likely cropped down and originally had all of these lines. It was probably just getting overly long in the movie. We both Not did us. it! You're I'm a little more a than me, more but still, than you. come on. When they're no, giving out the what? awards, I'm gonna be right what there next what to you, right, sir? What? So, what's the plan, sir? I have no idea! Hit it! Megamind's... A match. 
the most horrible, terrifying, evil thing you can possibly think of, and multiply it by six. That's not in there. Hell's Bouncy Houses versus Clown Line isn't in there. Maybe this is written a little oddly, but in the book, instead of running from Roxanne, Megamind seems to be running toward her. It does make it a little confusing because Roxanne is walking toward him. He's racing after her and calling her, so it seems weird that she wouldn't see him pretty quickly. In the movie, it's the opposite and he's running away. My guess is that maybe in the book, the idea is that he doesn't want her to get blown up, but it's not very clear and I don't know if this is just written a little bit strangely. It specifies that he got Roxanne safely in a cab. That cab must have gotten there pretty fast. But he makes sure of her safety first. Megamind has never seen a phone before. Maybe it just means close up because I'm sure people must have their phones out all the time. But maybe he's never held one or really seen one close up. After all, who's calling Megamind? He does say this in the movie as well. But specifying that Minion is a creation of science and Minion's design with a little antennae thing on his head would imply that Minion is artificially created in some way. Here he makes an excuse that his stuff is left from a previous tenant, and Megamind also attempts to eat the evidence. The brain bots thought Megamind was playing fetch with the dynamite. He just did what a very slim minority of people would do. The book specifies that Megamind is exaggerating when calling Hal brave. Also, Hal thinks Bernard looks old. Hal does a bit more than just dance in the car in the book. The middle section of the book deviates a lot from the movie. Here, Megamind trains Hal in his warehouse and does some of the same things, but instead of riding Hal and flying around, they tie him up like a kite while Minion holds the rope. Their back and forth is a little different too. He and Minion also have different conversations about Roxanne. Megamind and Roxanne go to the library together in the book and reminisce about Metro Man there. Megamind asks Roxanne for advice on mentoring a troubled youth, and Roxanne tells him how she tries to encourage Hal. Megamind then tries Roxanne's strategy, encouraging Hal even though Hal is arguing with Space Stepmom. Hal actually complains that Space Stepmom won't let him do anything. Hal actually does start bantering back and forth with Megamind. In the book, Megamind is also helping Roxanne reconstruct Megamind's plan in her apartment, though he tries to sabotage it when she's not looking. It also mentions a few more evil things Megamind has done. Melting a bank, building a laser cannon on a mountain, and turning the Atlantic Ocean into jello. Apparently, the last one was unintentional. The scene with Megamind and Hal talking on the hill is slightly different too, but gets to the same point. Titan has a scene where he introduces himself and challenges Megamind. Megamind acts as Roxanne's cameraman here for some reason. This is where Hal originally started hitting on Roxanne. It also makes it clear that Hal just didn't know how to spell his name. Megamind is a little meaner to Minion in the book when they argue. Roxanne brags to her mom on the phone about the new man she met. I think this is the only time we really see her life outside of what's happening with Megamind. Roxanne is able to more clearly state that Megamind was behind everything to Hal. Megamind starts trying to suggest to Roxanne that maybe he's thinking of giving up Delaney. Megamind has something against donuts. Here is why I think the B on Hal's costume might stand for brawn. I haven't seen anything else, so it's my best guess. This brings up the point of Megamind wanting to make another hero again. It's in both books, so I'm guessing that was what originally was going to happen. Roxanne even finds a strand of hair. It also states Metro Man has memorabilia of their battles, even though it looks like pictures of himself in the movie. They find Metro Man shaving with an electric sander and reading a newspaper. Metro Man confirms that music is the only thing that ever challenged him. So everyone that theorized that Metro Man picked up music because it was the only thing his powers didn't help with can celebrate now. But he's also more self-centered and uncaring in the book. The original Metro Man was simply going to be self-absorbed like this, and this looks like he was still that way fairly far into production. I almost wonder if it was actor input suggesting that Metro Man doesn't have to be a jerk. I think the movie version is far superior to what we were given here, so I'm glad it was changed. 
we see the reason why Megamind gave up. Roxanne also gives her speech about never giving up at this point, so it doesn't appear later in the book when she's on the tower. Instead, she just gives up then. Hal gives a tiny bit of backstory here, a very small amount. The line about not dying isn't in the book. Instead, Megamind Minion says he's winging it. Roxanne also doesn't reveal Megamind. Instead, Megamind keeps trying to pretend he's Metro Man. Megamind doesn't get thrown into the air, either. He defuses Hal at the invisible car. Hal also wakes up and tries to blame what happens on Natit. So we can see overall a similar story here, with a few different beats. At times it contradicts what's in the movie, like with Metro Man's overall attitude, but at other times it's consistent with what's there, and sometimes it adds a little bit more. I think it's safe enough to say that when something is consistent with what's in the movie, it's probably safe to go ahead and consider it canon-based. I'll include an affiliate link in the description. If you're interested, the books are pretty cheap and quick reads, and there's more little things you can pick out in them. I'd recommend just buying a copy if you're curious. There's also an earlier script posted online. I'll have that link below if you want to look at it yourself. This one is quite a bit different, though you see some of the same story beats. The overall story of killing the good guy, the bad guy getting sad about it, making a new good guy, the fake death, etc. Those are all there. You can tell it's the basis for this movie. However, whereas the book mostly has the same lines with a few differences, this is the opposite. Most of the lines are different, with a couple being the same. Megamind is called Mastermind. Metro Man is Uberman. Instead of Minion, Mastermind has three not-as-cute henchmen called Einstein, Da Vinci, and Plato. And Roxanne Ritchie and Hal Stewart have the same names. To do a quick plot summary, Mastermind kidnaps Roxanne. He more blatantly has a crush on her in this script. He kills Uberman, and then he and his henchmen go on a crime spree. Hal has no connection to anyone in this script. He's a random guy working at a bowling alley but he gets fired for everything from laziness to sexual harassment. He accidentally bumps a woman and her baby out of the way of a construction accident and gets praised as a hero for it. Roxanne gets demoted from her reporting gig because she mostly had her position due to being close to Uberman. She gets put on fluff pieces instead. We go through the same basic stuff of Mastermind getting upset that he has no one to fight against anymore. Mastermind more proactively spies on Roxanne to get close to her, finding out she has a crush on John Cusack when she's talking to her friends. He goes on to impersonate the actor and purposefully bumps into her to talk to her. In this version, Roxanne actually was dating Uberman, but they'd broken up. Mastermind is convinced from news reports that Hal is a good, noble person, and that's why he picks Hal to be the new hero. He still pretends to be Hal's mentor and trains him. Roxanne does find out Mastermind was in a disguise, and this turns out similar to the movie, with her dumping him. Since Hal doesn't know Roxanne, Mastermind convinces Hal to fight him by pretending to kill his mentor later on. But like in the movie, Hal doesn't show up. Instead, he goes bad. It more explicitly states here that Titan wanted to call them Brain and Brawn, but in the original, he couldn't think of what to draw to represent Brawn. This goes along with my theory that the bee stood for Brawn. Hal decides to destroy the city using a giant bowling ball statue from on top of the bowling alley to knock over a bunch of the city buildings. That'll destroy Mastermind's secret lair, and there's a hydrogen reactor there that'll blow up when Hal hits it, and destroy the whole eastern seaboard. Roxanne tells Mastermind that Uberman was secretly the billionaire, Wayne Scott. Mastermind goes to Wayne Scott's mansion alone, and finds his secret hideout. At this point, it turns out Uberman is alive, but he was actually weak to copper. The copper only encased him from the top, so he drilled into the ground to get away. In this version, Uberman thought of their fights as a game, while Mastermind was always trying to fight for real. Mastermind is going to flee the city completely. Roxanne tries to convince him to come back and fight, while Mastermind tries to convince her to flee with him. He decides to go back and fight once Hal kidnaps Roxanne and a cameraman, in order to film him making the biggest bowling strike in history. Uberman does show back up during this fight to help Mastermind, just to get vaporized instantly? I'm not sure why Hal's laser vision would vaporize him, since it would be based on his own powers, 
but that's what happens. Mastermind wins by punching Titan in the crotch with a copper gauntlet, and then the face. Then Mastermind becomes the hero to the city. I left out a lot, but you can read the whole script if you want. Like in this version, Mastermind has a father who raised him to be evil. The script is a little strange because it's oddly sexual and has actual cursing in it, but at the same time has pee jokes and such. For example, Hal peeing on people from the sky. It's also a bit disjointed because Hal is some random guy with no connection to anybody else. He has no reason to be invested in Roxanne here, and it feels a bit out of place. One of Mastermind's minions ditches him in the middle, much like how Minion leaves, but he just doesn't come back. There are some little remnants we can see that remain in the background of the original movie without being addressed. For example, this script talks about how Hal wants to fly in his own way, like pretending he's flying an invisible jet instead of flying like a superhero. We still see him do this in the movie a few times, while Megamind tries to teach him to fly like Metro Man instead. So we have some quirks of Hal in here. But even though Mastermind has a few henchmen, it looks like they were all combined to be Minion, so we don't really have any more villains to work with here. So any other villains were mostly already scrapped by this time. Still, I was surprised to find anything new at all, and maybe some of the scrapped side characters will come back in the TV series. After all, Roxanne would have co-workers and such, so we could put a pin on that and continue on to the next thing the comics. It's hard to find information about the comics and what's in them, and they can be hard to find and expensive since they're out of print. So I'll try to help out here. First off, there are two prequel comics. The Reign of Megamind comic was an exclusive given out at 2010's San Diego Comic Con. The only story in it is called The Reign of Megamind, and covers a variety of Megamind schemes while he was still a villain. Then there's this comic, which is like an issue zero, I guess, for Megamind Bad Blue Brilliant. This also has a story of the reign of Megamind in it, but it's on a higher quality glossy paper in a smaller format. It also includes Minion 2.0, where Megamind and Minion reminisce about Minion's various robot bodies over the years. Then we have number one in the series of four comics. Can I have this stance? Minion, where's the car? and Minion's Day Off Part 1 are all in this issue. Volume 2 has Bad Minion Bad, All the Best Toys, and Minion's Day Off Part 2. Volume 3 has Megamutt, Minion's Day Off Part 3, and Rockstar. Volume 4 has a Sidekick Sidekick, Misfortune Cookie, and a Minion's Day Off Part 4. There's also this comic collection. Despite having a cover similar to Volume 3's cover, it's a different comic. It has all of the stories from volumes 1 to 4 collected into one book, but it doesn't have The Reign of Megamind or Minion 2.0. Now that what's in each volume is cleared up, let's take a look at each story. The Reign of Megamind. The story starts off with Roxanne reading off a script Megamind wrote for her live on air before she refuses to read it anymore. Megamind reveals himself and subjects the people to the Megamind experience which apparently means showing them a reel of his past schemes. Plan 324, Brawn Bots, which came before his obviously superior Brain Bots. Plan 654, The Equestrinator, which was not a unicorn. Meanwhile, Minion worked hard on brainwashing the kids. Plan 601, The Head Zeppelin. Of course, Miss Ritchie doesn't see the genius of Megamind's plans and thinks they're failures. But the truth was that he was tricking Metro Man into revealing his weaknesses the whole time. As it turns out, Metro Man has a hypersensitive sense of smell, and Roxanne hasn't changed what perfume she wears since high school. Which is really weird of Megamind to notice. Stop sniffing Roxanne, Megamind. Thus, he lures Metro Man into the Recyclotron of Doom, using bits of his old plans in order to trap Metro Man. Unfortunately, that cunning devil Miss Ritchie takes advantage of Megamind's generosity to share about himself to distract him while Metro Man welds the pressure plate in place so he can move. Of course, it ends with Megamind in jail, with no one even appreciating that he was recycling. Minion 2.0? Megamind and Minion are cleaning up the lair because apparently Roxanne is coming over for dinner, and they find a scrapbook showing off Minion's different bodies over the years. That's the plot. 
It also seems to have another reference to Indiana Jones, similar to the face melter stuff in the movie, but this would mean Megamind has a snake phobia. There are also some pages in the back. Apparently Minion wants to be upgraded from Minion to Sidekick. Can I have this dance? This takes place during Megamind's high school years, where he went to Metro City High. He's having trouble getting along with other students, who can't fully fathom his greatness. Minion is pretending to be an exchange student. Megamind has a bit of a crush on Roxanne, and he overhears that she's going to prom with Metro Dude. So he makes plans to blast a hole in the dam, and create a rush of water that will hit the prom king before they start their dance. Also, Minion is really excited for prom, even though he has to show up as Minyovichi's beautiful sister. Fortunately, Minion is incredible at disguises, so no one notices. Minion gets into the spirit of prom and Roxanne approaches Megamind, who is totally smooth and calm. Megamind is apparently very good at writing about world domination, so maybe that 900-page autobiography would have been a blast. When the prom king and queen are announced, Roxanne is standing on the Y instead of Metro Dude, so Megamind challenges Metro Dude to a dance-off in order to stall. Roxanne is, of course, incredibly impressed by the astounding display of masculine maturity. By the time Minion finally gets out of the bathroom and sees what's happening, Megamind is exhausted and collapses on the stage where the Y is, getting hit by his own spout of water. For some reason, Megamind gets detention. Fortunately, he's invented something to take care of cleaning duty. Minion, where's the car? Megamind has DVDs to return, but they need to find the invisible car. This is just a montage of Megamind and Minion searching for the car. Bad Minion, bad. Megamind builds a machine that can reverse a person's nature and accidentally hits Minion with it. Megamind tries to go after Minion, but Minion knows everything about him and predicts his every move. So he goes to the smoothie shop where Roxanne suggests something she did as a kid. She got a new best friend to make her former best friend jealous. While the warden is giving Megamind some advice, Minion Master shows up on the news. And you can tell he's really gone evil because he's even robbing pet shops. Megamind puts in an ad for a new sidekick, but immediately fires everyone who applies. Unfortunately, he has a major issue trying to take down Minion. Minion knows everything about him, but he hasn't taken the time to know everything about Minion. So they decide on a new plan to lure Minion to them. Roxanne gets Megamind on the news to challenge Minion. Minion shows up to prove himself the biggest villain in Metro City, and he predicts Megamind's attacks. But when Megamind pulls out something new, he grabs Roxanne as a hostage, only to be tricked into putting the headband on himself, which really just saps Minion unconscious, so they can take him back to the lair and restore him to himself. All the best toys. There's a school trip going through Megamind's lair, but the kids get into all sorts of trouble. Megamind decides that the lair isn't ready for tours yet. Megamind. Minion wants to get a dog, but Megamind doesn't want to. Then they find a blue dog that comes out of a fallen star. Thinking that the dog must be a late arrival from their planet, Megamind ends up getting attached to Megamud, even though Minion was the one who wanted to get a dog. And then he ends up doing everything with a super-powered dog and neglecting Minion and even Roxanne to spend time with the dog. But as it turns out, Megamut was part of a program testing experimental spacecrafts and got caught in a freak energy storm. Megamind is disappointed that he wasn't a survivor from their planet, but he still has Minion and Roxanne. Rock Star. A falling star hits the Earth and turns Roxanne into a rock star, and then someone gives her a drink and she turns back to normal. That summary probably makes it make more sense than it actually does. A sidekick sidekick. A kid finds out where Megamind's lair is on the internet and begs to be Minion's sidekick. While he's good enough at doing chores, when it comes to important stuff, he's too young and impatient and won't listen to the rules. He ends up causing trouble instead of helping, so Megamind fires him. But he steals some of Megamind's defective equipment to try and be a hero on his own, and ends up getting into more trouble. Luckily, Megamind saves the day, but Mini Minion realizes he still has a lot to learn. Misfortune Cookie Minion gets a fortune cookie that says he'll be blessed with a string of good luck and he walks around wondering what good luck he'll have while everything goes his way, until he finds out the fortune is expired. Minion's day off. Minion takes the day off. Trying to find his own eyebrow and goatee wax, Megamind finds a big red button and pushes it. It turns out to start the process of putting the city in a dome and shooting it off into space. Megamind tries to find the deactivation code, but Minion ends in picking up. Megamind sends Roxanne a message to let her know it's a mistake while he goes to try and find Minion. 
Roxanne finds the deactivation code stuck to Megamind's butt. He gets back to use it, but the city takes off. Luckily, Minion recorded a message for Megamind, so Megamind activates a control panel in the park and steers the city back to Earth. Rise of the Mega Brain Boss. You might be wondering what right now, but I actually found this when I was checking into the writers and artists for the comic series so I could link their pages if they were active online. Troy Dye had this comic and a few of the other Megamind strips up on his site, so I suppose we need to thank Troy Dye for being able to see this. Apparently this comic was part of a Happy Meal promotion in the UK. Because Megamind has so much crime to fight, he decides to upgrade the Brain Boss to patrol the city 24-7. They don't handle the rain very well though. At the end, another superhero alien named Tilly shows up to help. You can check out the whole thing on his site. Overall, I think the comics are okay. And you might think that I would criticize them, but not really. A lot of times people on projects like these are on severe time constraints. And they had one other major issue they were dealing with. It looks like they had these characters to use. See the problem? There's only one character here who ever causes problems, which makes it hard when he has to be the hero. It doesn't look like they got any villains to work with. Because of that, several stories revolved around Megamind fixing a problem he caused. The highlight was probably a sidekick sidekick, because we get to see Megamind doing substantial hero work there that he isn't the cause of. I think that's where we most get to see Megamind being a hero. I also liked Roxanne's story in Bad Minion Bad. While it's not exactly a good thing for her to have used someone as a kid, it's a simple and realistic story. Kids are pretty immature and do selfish things. It's more interesting than trying to make Roxanne out to be a perfect person. We also see that Megamind and Metro Man met Roxanne in high school. And while we don't know if Metro Man ever had a crush on her, it was clear Megamind did, which makes sense. There are some bits like that that a new series could draw from, but since we already have Button of Doom, I don't think the new TV series or movie should repeat the plot of Megamind's past evil devices going off and him saving the city from himself. We already got that. As far as whether I would recommend the comics, while they have their issues, they have a dynamic style that stands out, especially in this era of people flooding art sites with generic AI art. They're bold, colorful, and creative. Characters like Megamite and Minion are out of the ordinary as far as design. And I think some of the artists especially captured a good balance of making that aesthetically pleasing while still capturing their absurdity. If you have a chance to get the comics, I would go ahead and recommend them. Next up, the art book. I'll drop an affiliate link for it, but it's pretty expensive. It's also archived online, and I'll have a link in the description for that, too. We can find a few good things in here. We do have a note about how Megamind's confidence was shattered when he realized that Metro Man just quit, which goes along with the novels. He also gets compared to a heel in wrestling, and it mentions that Megamind has a high moral code. And here's why I say that going up against Megamind has given Metro Man some gray hairs. It seems like Megamind's relentlessness has taken a toll on him. And again, it goes into how Metro Man was originally imagined as a jerk. We see what the citizens think of Megamind too. They view his schemes like a big show, safe enough even to take babies to. The citizens don't seem to take him all too seriously, which we still see in the movies somewhat as people go to actually watch the show when Megamind challenges Titan. They're not really all that afraid of his big giant robot beyond property damage. This is the biggest page I want to focus on as far as what will we see in the future? We get our first look at the characters we're most likely going to be seeing. Three that are probably a shoe in are Psychodelic, Destruction Worker, and Hot Flash. This entire page has good info, and the art book has more images of them since they were even meant to be in the first movie. Unfortunately, we don't get too much more than a couple of sentences about them. We don't know how they got powers, where they came from, what their motivations are, or anything like that. And one last bit is that Megamind purposefully mispronounces Metro City. So anyone who wants to know what's coming would be encouraged to look at the art book and see the villains that were originally designed for Megamind. It seems like Hal might get a girlfriend though. Now, the video games. First off, I have to give a big thanks to Wishing T. Call for allowing me to use the clips from her gameplay. Thank you very much. 
She has a full playthrough of each of the Megamind games up on her channel, and I've linked to each one in the description if you want to go see them. The games themselves also aren't all that expensive if you have the systems to play them on. So Megamind Ultimate Showdown. Megamind is announcing that crime has been abolished in Metro City when Roxanne gets an update about the Doom Syndicate showing up. The Doom Syndicate has robbed Megamind's lair, taking the Metro Essence, his binky, my blue ion nanokinetic energ e yes oh not my pinky and his mega essence mega mind goes through the various levels to collect the parts for his dna tracker and dna to track down blue titan it's a pretty straightforward platformer with minion constantly telling mega mind everything he needs to do mega mind fights destruction worker first our destruction worker my unworthy opponent at last we meet. Megamind! Prepare to get... Dem destructed! <laughs> then he goes through the sewers and fights Psychodelic. Glad you could join us, Megamind. Psychodelic! So colorfully deranged! Well then, now all the guests are here. Let the party begin. Not for long, because I'm here to bring you to justice. Not before we party like a plague first, baby. Get that super square. Last, he goes to the Metro City Diner to fight Hot Flash. Mega Mine. Ah, Hot Flash. So we finally meet. I see you got past my goons, sweetie. I won't let you flambeau this fair city, Hot Flash. Get him! At the end of the game, he goes up against Blue Titan, which is just Titan with Metro Man and Megamind's essences, and abuses him at the end. Breathe in and out, Titan Ick Beast. In and out. <laughs> Whoa, dude, wh what's going on? Where's Roxanne? There isn't exactly deep lore here, and we don't really find out a lot about the Doom Syndicate, but we do finally see a little bit of them, and even hear their voices, even if it's only a few sentences. Megamind Mega Team Unite? Part of the opening for this is the same as the first game, but adds on with Megamind forming his own superhero team called the Mega Squad. To that end, Megamind has formed his own superhero team, the Mega Squad. Notably, Titan is part of your team right away, so perhaps he's reformed since the last game. It's sort of a mix of a beat-em-up and a party game with up to four players. As they go through each level, the boss joins the mega team after they're defeated, going from Destruction Worker, Psychodelic, Judge Sludge, Hot Flash, and the Conductor. We get to see a bit more of the main three with two added characters. The storylines are pretty simple, like they're robbing the museum, stop them. I'm Roxanne Ritchie in front of the Metro City Bank. New developments as destruction worker goons have robbed the bank. Hey, wait, that's my bank. Mega Squad, get my money back! So we still don't have too much to go on. They do each get their own little intros to show their characters. Megamind the Blue Defender. This has the same plot as Ultimate Showdown. It does add some gadgets for Megamind though. The Electric Lasso, the Expandomatic, the Fusion Bouncer, and the Doom Barrage. And we do see some slightly different moves from the bosses. So the games really just give us a taste of what's probably to come. Whew. That should cover most of what's out there so far. Now that we're all caught up, let's speculate about what's to come. So I'm going to pitch some ideas around. Here's a few things that I was thinking of. And all my ideas could fit in one season, 
but I'm splitting it up into two seasons for this because I wouldn't want anything to distract from the Doom Syndicate in the first season. 16 episodes is pretty long. You could do a lot in that. So I do have this split up and a lot of other stuff could fit in there. These are just a couple ideas I had. So first off, most people don't know the comics or the video games or anything. So we need to go in assuming most viewers have only seen the first movie. Based on the first movie, we have two alien characters established, but everything else in the city seems pretty normal. Meaning we need to take our time establishing each Doom Syndicate member. It's going to look out of place if we go from having a normal city to suddenly a purple skeleton is disco dancing around without an explanation. <laughs> The main movie trimmed down the amount of characters to the bare minimum to focus on them, which worked for the movie. But with a whole TV series, we need to flesh out the world more and add more characters. First episode, I would have Megamind handling standard crimes and emergencies in the beginning with varying levels of success. Some of his hero attempts might go off perfectly. Some might be like he's juggling hot potatoes. In the end, he saves people and doesn't let anyone get hurt, but there might be a bit of unexpected property damage or something. This is where we introduce our first actual villain. I would start with Destruction Worker. We need to set up where he came from, why is he a villain, all that sort of stuff. Did he used to work in construction but became unemployed when Megamind stopped restoring the city? <laughs> What's his motivation? Whatever it is, we set it up here. Although we don't know their backstories, I'm guessing that their creators already had something in mind that never made it to the screen. So that's what I'd start dropping in here. These first episodes would be for establishing our basic group of villains as individuals. I would give each two episodes to get themselves established, and that's when I would break up the status quo. I would make the sixth episode centered around Hot Flash's second scheme. And after Megamind stops her, and she's trying to escape, have Psychedelic approach her to suggest a team up and help her get away. I think it would be best to start the Doom Syndicate with the two more intelligent members. They realize they're going to need more power at their disposal to take down Megamind. Hot Flash could even be on guard when Psychedelic approaches her because she doesn't know what he's there for, and she should be on the more cunning side. Psychedelic could be more in charge of bringing Destruction Worker into the fold and keeping him under control. If we're going to bring Hal back, I'd make a really good reason why it has to be him specifically. We need to answer the question of, why wouldn't somebody else just take the Metro Essence? Why would they get it to Hal? It could be as simple as saying that because it was in Hal for so long, it's only compatible with him anymore, or something like that. Psychodelic and Hot Flash would be the ones to realize they need a big hitter and come up with a plan to free Hal and get Titan on their side. Considering the initial idea of Hot Flash being Hal's girlfriend, she should be the one to essentially tell Hal what to do. One of Hal's major flaws was being lazy and unmotivated. He had to be pushed to do things, and that's what Hot Flash could do. There could even be jokes like them showing up to free Hal, and him asking if they could come back in 10 minutes because it's almost lunchtime. This would get the main four together over season one as they slowly evolve their plans. We could also bring in stuff from the side content, for example, we can have a repeating joke where Jive Turkey is trying to make his big villain debut, but he constantly gets caught in the crossfire of whatever battle is going on and gets blown off screen before he even makes it to the foreground. And we could add things like Hal liking bullying. Most people won't know that's a reference to the earlier script, but it would add a little something to his character and people who pick up on the reference would get it. I would have Megamind and Roxanne's relationship remain solid. They could have disagreements or get frustrated with each other, but I wouldn't have any dramatic breakups or anything. These two have known each other a long time. They know what they're getting into with each other. Roxanne isn't going to be shocked that Megamind is acting like Megamind. She can be the one who helps out when they're overcomplicating things. I would also have Megamind develop as the show goes. For example, in the comic he mentions how he can't use the I used to be a villain excuse forever for all his bad behavior. As the show goes on, I would have him improve himself and keep those improvements. He might realize he needs to stop blaming everything on Minion and stop doing that. But this has to remain consistent. He can't have that realization and then go back to blaming Minion in the next episode. At most, I would have him catch himself going back to a bad habit and correct it, maintaining consistent character growth. Minion is a difficult one to have an arc with 
because you're not going to have him leave Megamind and go off on his own. He's also a stable character as it is, so there's not too much of a character arc to have with him. Breaking up Megamind and Minion would feel a bit forced, especially since it's already in the movie, and even then it was played up to make fun of the third act breakup trope. For him, I could lean more into humor. Since he's the one who always wears dresses when they're disguised, what if he finds a group of girlfriends and that starts turning into an overdramatic soap opera behind the scenes? We start off with him having a relatively normal friendship with a group of women, and with each episode, whenever it gets brought up, it slowly gets more and more absurd and dramatic. <laughs> we could start off with something like, you know, Stacy's getting married, that's so nice, to Rebecca's in a coma and her evil twin sister has been taking her place? Even better if there's like a whole story that continues with each mention of it, so anyone who spliced all the background mentions of it together would get a full story. Meanwhile, Minion's reacting to each bit of drama in all seriousness. But of course, this is a comedy, and you can keep comedy stuff in there, there's nothing wrong with that, while having the more serious storylines. <laughs> Megamind was really good at balancing the comedy and the seriousness. Metro Man I would keep retired. He could be working on his music in the background, and maybe Megamind could turn to him for hero advice when he runs into tough times. But taking him out of retirement would send a message that you're going to be stuck doing something you don't want to, no matter what. That doesn't mean he'd let a baby get run over or something. He could still do perfectly normal stuff that other people would do, but he's out of the superhero business for good. Maybe he's even forming a band or getting to know people outside of being worshipped all the time. And he could have his own struggles. He's never had to deal with criticism so much before. So even though he wants to go out and do these things that he struggles with, you know, he could struggle with it. This is the first time he would have to really take his time to learn how to do something. He's not used to it. He's used to picking stuff up real fast. And at times he could get frustrated with that too. So that mostly covers the first half of the first season. But we would need to introduce more characters into the mix both friend and foe. Some other villains could be revived and revamped, but a lot of them never left the concept phase, so some brand new ones might need to be introduced. You can't just have Megamind go up against the same three 50 times in a row. That'd get old. And that's why at the midpoint of season one, I would drop a hint of something to come. Have a box appear in Megamind's lair from out of nowhere. What is it? Well, it contains the instructions on how to put the pieces together to make a teleportation machine or a portal or the like. Megamind, of course, has no problem figuring that out, but the machine is tiny, so he can only send messages back and forth with whoever is on the other side. At this point, there's no motive for why the box was sent to Megamind, other than there needs to be an anchor on the other side to reliably teleport anything to a certain place. So basically, the box is kind of like adding an address to a place. We're just setting up two things. There's another genius out there somewhere in the universe, and they're sending out at least one box to try and open communications with someone who could put it together. Just hold on a second here. Just let me steal this real fast. Megamind, of course, can be excited to talk to another genius without questioning the motive behind it. And that plot point will be left there in the background for now while maybe one or two more potential villains are set up in the second half of the season, and the villains are getting together to form a single unit to fight Megamind. I'd also take the time to mix in good messaging based on the original concept of the show. Kids these days are online, and there are a lot of messages they need to get. Some examples I can think of offhand is don't compare yourself to people's timelines, because they're faking how good their lives are. It's like comparing yourself to a photoshopped model. Don't rush to judge someone without getting the full story. How many times have we seen someone accused of something? They get dogpiled, and then it turns out that the whole story wasn't out, and they were innocent. And I can mention catfishing, identity theft, and lots of other issues kids will have to face online in the same humorous way that it dealt with the issues in the movie. You don't have to beat them over the head with these messages. You could just use them as plot points and bring them up so that you could say, hey, you know, sometimes people are lying online. <laughs> if somebody's floating around on a yacht and acting like that's their normal life, that may not be true. The season one finale, or maybe this would even be the movie, would be Megamind taking on the whole Doom Syndicate and winning. Just barely. This may even be the time to have Megamind ask Metro Man for advice. And the teaser at the end could be that just being pen pals wasn't enough, so Megamind made a larger version of the teleportation machine 
and he could finally meet the other genius face to face, setting up something new for the second season. Which Roxanne can point out is a questionable idea because he knows nothing about this person. All they've talked about is inventions and science and stuff. But you know, Megamind would be excited to talk to someone like-minded who can understand his hobbies. So we have another, kind of evil looking, mad scientist type. There are two major reasons I picked this type of character. The first one is that he and Megamind have a clear similarity. It doesn't take any explaining to understand why these two characters would be interested in talking to each other or why Megamind would want to hang out. He's never had friends outside of Minion, and now here's someone who understands his excitement for technology and gadgets and is actively interested in everything he's doing. I'll explain the second major reason later. This character would be in the background. At this point, he's seemingly a new ally, cordial, excited to share about their hobbies, generally helpful when asked. He doesn't need to be better than Megamind at engineering. He could be more of an all-rounder with more experience in various fields, notably maybe anything that has to do with war, like medical care, weapons engineering, actual coded communications, etc. On the other hand, we make them complete opposites in other aspects. Megamind is a chaotic mess with junk everywhere, so this guy is obsessively organized. Megamind is very emotional. This guy can have alexithymia. That's emotional blindness. Megamind believes strongly in good versus evil. This guy could be true neutral, with no interest in being good or evil. So we set up the basis for a friendship, and then we set up things that will become a problem later. At the moment, they're just getting along, ignoring each other's quirks. There's actually quite a bit of space to work with for two seasons, when they have this many episodes each. But like I said in the beginning, I wouldn't want anything to undermine the Doom Syndicate in the first season. I'd want to keep it to that and introduce new things later. So there's going to be a lot of extra space here. So you can assume a lot of this will be other stuff happening. These are just a couple ideas. In season two, we may want to bring in a new type of villain that Megamind would struggle with, considering that we just did a bunch of stuff with the Doom Syndicate. My initial thought would be maybe a Dahlia Hawthorne type. And this is where Roxanne could shine a bit more, because I think Megamind would struggle dealing with someone so manipulative. For people who don't know the Ace Attorney series, this would be someone who uses a sweet, gentle front to manipulate and use others. But there could be many ways this season goes. The main thing would be to introduce a new type of threat. And I think it'd be good to have one that would give Megamind a hard time. Someone more underhanded, more sinister, who could easily take advantage of the fact that it would look bad for Megamind to be rough with her. It gives Roxanne a chance to step up because she's not going to let someone mess with her boyfriend like that. This might even be a good time to bring social media problems into play. What if she has a larger audience than him? What if she's good at manipulating any attack on her to look bad for him? It's the sort of thing Megamind wouldn't have any experience with, and it could even offend him. He's had all these brilliant villainous plots he's pulled off, and she's going to lie about him? doing something that he wouldn't even do. But a big part of this would be switching things up from the Doom Syndicate to keep the threat fresh and new. The Doom Syndicate wouldn't be gone, but perhaps reworking their plots in the background? You could even have how they feel about the new threat in there. Do they like it? Are they annoyed by it? Does the new person overstep a line they have? Would they work with her? Would they work against her? So in the foreground, I would be establishing the new type of threat and why it's so difficult for Megamind to handle it by himself. In the background, I would have his new friendship start on good footing and then get shaky. An easy way in this example would be that Megamind is an emotional person and would tend towards trying to make the people he cares about happy, perhaps to the point that he would ignore his feelings getting stomped on a bit. If the other character is blind to emotions, he might come off as dismissive or uncaring without meaning to, bluntly stating things without understanding how he's coming off and being incapable of noticing when it hurts Megamind's feelings. It doesn't have to be malicious, but you have two characters inexperienced with friendships and ignoring the issues instead of communicating. So while they're still maintaining this new friendship, the new guy is getting more invested in what he's actually there for and neglecting Megamind. So in the first A plot, we can resolve it with Roxanne stepping up to play defense for Megamind. It can be similar to when a much larger creator gets a ton of people to dogpile on a smaller creator, but Roxanne would be in a position to help Megamind expose what's really happening. If the Doom Syndicate doesn't like the new person, maybe they're even helping in the background. After that's resolved, this background plot finally comes into the foreground, and we finally find out what the motivation was for teleporting. Now, you can do a lot of things with this. 
But the most important thing to me will be that what the new scientist wants to do, and what Megamind wants, are decisively opposed. For example, if we say the scientist was from a country that was obliterated in a war, and that's why he was throwing mini teleportation units out into the universe everywhere, hoping for a chance to escape a dangerous situation. He doesn't want to just sit around, though. Even if he's the last person standing, he wants to go back and go down in a blaze of glory with as much firepower as he can muster. On one hand, you could understand someone wanting to fight for the home they just lost. On the other hand, it wouldn't accomplish anything. He'll die, and he'll take a bunch of other people with him. So Megamind would want to stop him. And I said earlier that there were two major reasons why I picked this type of character. One, it established a clear basis for a friendship. And this is the second reason. Megamind is a kid's show. That means you can only do so much with the fights. Megamind isn't going to decapitate Hot Flash or something. This is like in Ninja Turtles when they never actually get to use their sharp weapons. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you kind of have to pull the punches in the kids' shows. But this introduces an entirely different fight. Now you have two people engineering machines for battle who don't even want to hurt each other going head-to-head -head full force to see which one could take out the other one's machine army. Two different styles of strategy and engineering. On top of which, we set them up sharing their creations. So they know what the other one has, and they're now implementing those strategically to one-up the other. It's very much a game of chess, rather than trying to outpunch each other. One example is, what's the one machine we already established for the new guy? A teleportation device. So he can incorporate that, into the design of whatever vehicle he's using for transport. Instead of a standard barrier or wall, when something gets close enough to his vehicle, it can be teleported and redirected to any angle he wants. Of course, most things would move too fast for a human to react to, so a computer would be handling it. It might sound like it would be impossible to hit him if everything gets teleported away, but maybe Megamind knows that using the teleportation device takes an immense amount of energy and decides to try and overload it. And like that, you would mix in every invention they've been sharing, most probably not seemingly meant for battle, but being used in a strategic way. This is the kind of scenario where you would write the fight first, and then go back and make sure you set up everything they need earlier in the series. And you could go absolutely wild with the fight, because it's all machines. You don't have to hold back on things getting smashed, exploding, shot, and I would establish firmly that the characters themselves have no interest in harming each other. The stakes aren't whether one is going to physically beat the other up, but whether Megamind can stop him from doing something with extremely high stakes. And Megamind wins in the end. Maybe because he had an invention that he was going to show the other scientist, but because our scientist was busy preparing for this mission and neglected his friendship, he didn't go over and see it, so he didn't know about it. But whatever the reason, Megamind wins and gains his first new ally, a support unit who may be rethinking what to do with his life, but who can help out when Megamind runs into issues in the future. And I'll end it at that part. I would establish allies for Megamind at a slower rate than villains, and keep changing up what sort of challenge Megamind is going up against. So what do you guys think? Was there anything in the video you didn't know before? Anything you want to add? What are you hoping to see in the new series? Whatever it is you want to say, the comment section is there for you. And with all that said, I'm going to leave this off on a message that I think everyone needs to hear more often. You're so pathetic. No matter what side you're on, you're always the loser. There's a benefit to losing. You get to learn from your mistakes. Don't be afraid of failing. Be afraid of looking back in 10 years and wishing you'd tried. Love you and good night.